Um, so we have Liv here today. Liv is an intercalating student doing the Plymouth A&E course and she's going to be covering um, the final session in the Zoom to final series of cardiology. So heart block and common cardiac rhythms like SVT, VT, AF, etc. So over to you Liv. Thanks. Oh. I'm not muted am I? <laughs> I can't tell. No you're not, I can hear you. I think. Fab. So just let that last person in. So yeah, hi everyone. Nice to see some of you again. Um, just before we start, these slides will be available afterwards. Um, if you complete this, the survey that Rachel's just posted in the chat, I'm happy to share these slides with everyone. I've put all the references at the end. Um, it is quite a word heavy slideshow. Um, so I thought it'd be useful for you all to be able to pull it up afterwards in the future near exams and stuff and use it as like reference for revision. That's why we've gone with quite content heavy. Um, feel free to ask any questions, any point. I've got my phone as a chat with the Zoom thing so I'll be able to see your questions popping through as well. Um, yeah, I will continue. See this right. Sorry. So to start off, just a general overview of cardiac arrhythmias. So a cardiac arrhythmia is anything that's an irregular rhythm. Um, it can be described as a bradyarrhythmia or a tachyarrhythmia, so fast or slow. Um, brady would be anything defined as less than 60 beats per minute. And a tachyarrhythmia is if your heart would be going above 100 beats per minute. <clears throat> it can also be defined as where the arrhythmia is starting from. So is it a supraventricular rhythm? So is that anywhere within the atria, so the sinus node or the AV node, or a ventricular arrhythmia? So that would originate below the AV node, sort of anywhere within the ventricles. So you can define it, as, as I said, a fast or slow or a supraventricular or ventricular. So some examples of supraventricular S or SVTs, we'll go through the, some of these in more detail later on in the slideshow, is your AF, your atrial tachycardia, your AVRT, your atrial flutter and your AVRNT. And that just shows the circuits which they're all going through. It's a good reference diagram for when you come back for revision. Um, so when we're looking at heart rhythm disorders and we're looking at them based on the ECGs, we can assess it using the, um, the rhythm, looking at the QRS complexes, and then is there any atrial activity present based on what the ECG is showing? So to start with, with the rhythm, is it regular or irregular? Very simple. When we're looking at the rhythm strip, is it irregularly irregular, regularly irregular, or is it just regular? So does anyone know what an irregular, irregular rhythm would sort of hint? Pop it in the chat. <clears throat> it's like a buzzword. Yeah, perfect AF. Um, so press, oh, the slides don't work. That's it. And then when we're looking at our QRS complexes, they can be defined as broad or narrow. So would any, does anyone know how many small squares we'd say is a narrow QRS complex? When looking on the ECGs? Sorry, let's tap. Four, yeah, nearly, so it's three. And then a broad QRS would be anything more than three. All right. And then does anyone know um, what that represents in terms of time? Three small squares. Yeah, perfect. 120. Perfect. And then when we're looking at our atrial activity, is it present or not? It's basically have we got P waves there. And then what's the relationship between the P waves and the QRS waves? We'll go into a bit more detail with those when we're looking at the ECGs. So, 
First of all, we're going to go through narrow complex tachycardias. So that's when the QRS is less than three small squares or as well as less than 120 milliseconds. And then it can be split into either a regular narrow complex tachycardia or an irregular narrow complex tachycardia. So the regular causes is a sinus tachycardia. So your heart rate is just naturally going a little bit faster. Um, you can have these atrial focus tachycardias and then atrial flutter as well. And then an irregular narrow complex tachycardia classically would be your AF. And we'll go into a bit more detail with some of these conditions as well. Um, this is just a slide to show how different ECGs can display different narrow complex tachycardias. So you've got your physiological, so you've got this narrow QRS here, the fast heart rate, same with this one. And then I'll flutter on our AV, RNTs and NRTs. I'm not going to cover these two in this um, PowerPoint this evening. That'll be something else we can do in the future if people want. It was just, it was going to be far too many slides. So I've picked out the, um, the more common ones. And then that's another reference slide. I'm not going to go through them. That'll be something you can look through yourself. Sort of the classic buzzwords associated with each one. And then when you Google these and look at this online, there's ways that you can sort of classify and work your way through a narrow complex tachycardia based on the ECG findings. Um, so just let you take a moment to, to read through that. And that basically will help you determine what type of narrow complex tachycardia you have, you've got on the ECG in front of you. So it's based on, is it regular or not? Have we got our P waves? And then looking at the, the, P, the intervals. You can take a screenshot, but as I said, the slides will be available afterwards. This would just be something you can have a read through at a later date. And then with our broad complex tachycardias, they tend to be originating in the ventricles. Their QRSs are more than 120 milliseconds or more than three small squares. And then some examples of ventricular tachycardias is VT, VF, or ventricular fibrillation and ventricular flutter and then torsad to point. Again, we'll be covering two of these today just because the volume of stuff trying to get through in the space of time allocated. So firstly, VT, you might have heard from any sort of ALS training. I know they sometimes go through it in older hay, things like that on placement. Um, it's potentially life-threatening arrhythmia originating in the cardiac ventricles. It usually results from some sort of underlying cardiac disease. So it could be post-MI or um, some sort of cardiomyopathy, but it can also be caused by other things such as drugs and electrolyte, Im electrolyte imbalances. Um, it has a wide range of clinical manifestations. So the person in front of you may be experiencing palpitations, they may be feeling slightly faint or syncope, having syncope, or they could have gone into a sort of a sudden cardiac failure or some sort of shock. The classic ECG findings with VT are wide QRS complexes and a tachycardia of more than 100 beats a minute. <clears throat> In an acute setting, the management of VT is immediate cardioversion and defibrillation. So you pop the pads and you give the patient an electric shock and it is one of the ALS protocols where it is a shockable rhythm. Um, and then most people who develop recurrent VT will re require some sort of long-term therapy, it may include medicines, implantation of a defib or some sort of ablation procedure on the heart. So our VT can be classified <clears throat> based on the duration the person experiences the VT for or the morphology. So it can either be sustained or non-sustained with the cutoff being 30 seconds. And then the morphology is if there's um, each beat varies or if it's a very similar sort of pattern of VT on the ECG. Um, many causes, so as I said, you could have some post um, heart attack or myocardial infarction, you could have some sort of ischemic event, angina, some inflammatory causes can cause you to go into VT um, or also some problems with conduction, so a channelopathy. Uh, 
this is like the fine, really fine detail. Don't be too overwhelmed with it. And then there's also um, drugs are known to cause them, such as digoxin or antiarrhythmics or and cocaine. So always ask about recreational drug use. So features are variable with VT. Um, can be symptomatic, they can be having palpitations, um, may have some sort of chest pain or a pressure, they might feel slightly breathless, breathless um, and they could have some symptoms of reduced cardiac output, so the dizziness, the hypertension, some sort of fainting episodes and in a really worst case scenario they could be in arrest. Um, with VT you want to immediately get the ECG and be able to diagnose it there and then and then um, treat ASAP because it can lead to a sudden cardiac death. So if anyone wants to take a guess on which one would be described as a polymorphic and which one is a monomorphic. Looking at the chat, which one's the top one? Yeah, perfect. So the bottom one is polymorphic and the non-monomorphic. So you can see the complexes are all similar in this one. So it's mono and this one's poly. They're all varying in size. So <clears throat> this is an emergency. Basically want to stop it as soon as possible. Um, if they're hemodynamically unstable, you would start CPR on them and prepare to defibrillate the patient. So you would pop the ECG, not the ECG, the defib pads on. Um, and it would be some sort of defibrillation or cardioversion. And if you weren't sure what was going on, you defibrillate, as it says here. Um, if you've got a stable patient, you could consider um, pharmacological interventions that would be with either amiodarone or adenosine, the two common ones which I've highlighted here. And then once you've had a patient go into VT, you're going to bring them in as an inpatient and try and find out the, evalu the underlying cause and treat that. So you could look at BNPs, troponins, magnesium levels, you want to take them probably for an echo whilst they're an inpatient and even potentially a cardiac MRI. And then you'd consider long term management to try and reduce that risk of them going back into VT in the future. So either um, pharmacological plus some sort of implantable device or an ablation where they go in as a procedure and sort of try and stop where those have, where those impulses are coming from, like burn them off. So ventricular fibrillation is another type of broad complex tachycardia. It's also another life-threatening arrhythmia and it's a high frequency ventricular contractions with reduced cardiac output and basically a hemodynamic collapse. Um, so again, it will be in a regular rhythm with widened QRS complexes on an ECG. <clears throat> it can be caused by coronary artery disease, post-MI, but also similar to VT, drugs can cause this. And they can have early signs such as chest pain, palpitations, dizziness. Um, but a lot of the time it will cause some sort of sudden hemodynamic instability. So the patient will lose consciousness and potentially could um, die. So you need to do immediate defib and resuscitation with your ALS protocols. So that would be an ECG sewing VFib. Again, it's one of our shockable rhythms, you might remember it as. And then this was um, a set of slides I took from when we went for our CBLs in fourth year. I think yours might have slightly changed now, but this is something you can refer back to. Just worried for time. And then this one just shows um, a comparison between ventricular fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia side by side, how the ECGs differ. So no matter what type of tachyarrhythmia, whether it's broad complex or narrow complex, you're gonna do your A to E assessment you're going to pop them on some monitoring so you want to be able to see that ECG 
and then you're going to try and determine um, any adverse features because that will sort of determine what your management plan is <clears throat> and then you're going to potentially prepare to shock them or give them some sort of pharmacological intervention based on what the ECG findings are. Oh, some people are entering. So with a narrow complex acute tachyarrhythmia, if the ECG is so showing a regular rhythm, we're going to say it's likely SVT. And we have a protocol to work through. Usually, most people will try vagal maneuvers and then they kind of skip carotid, si carotid sinus massage and go straight in with the adenosine. But the complete method is start off with the vagal maneuvers. So you want to get the patient um, where I've seen it in any, they lie them flat, pop their legs so they're higher. Um, and then they blow into a syringe. So you want to cause the increased interthoracic pressure and that will slow the heart rate down by stimulating the vagus nerve. Um, if that doesn't work, after a couple of attempts, you can do a carotid sinus massage. Um, but most of the times I've seen it in the hospital, they've gone straight with adenosine and that blocks the pathway between the sinoatrial node and the atrial ventricular node. And um, when you do it, you have to give them the drug and then a fluid bolus afterwards. And then afterwards, you can use some calcium blockers to slow the heart rate right down or flaconide. So that's your method you'd work through. And then if you had a narrow complex tachycardia that was irregularly irregular, we would say that would be likely AF. Um, with these patients, they have a, a risk, increased risk of a stroke. So we want to chadvask them and discuss that with the patient. We're going to talk about this later on in the talk. And then um, with AF, you want to classify it by the, the onset of the AF. If we know it has started within the, within the last 48 hours, we'd be able to rhythm control them. This can be done with um, flecainide and then amiodarone, and then we're going to anticoagulate anticoagulate them afterwards with a pixaban and then if it was after 48 hours um we would rate control them that's with our beta blockers or verapamil so a calcium channel blocker and then digoxin can also be used as well with a beta blocker and <clears throat> With all tachyarrhythmias, you want to identify and correct the underlying cause. We'd refer them to cardiology. Um, we would consider some sort of cardioversion even at a later date and consider them for like their long term management rather than just the acute thing what's going on. Um, I think it would be one or the other to start with. So we're going to go into a bit more detail with AF. So AF is the most common cardiac arrhythmia. There are a lot of people that have AF. They estimate around 5% of age 70 to 75. And once you get into the over 80 age group, about 80, um, 85, about 10% of those patients will have known AF. Um, Uncontrolled AF can result in palpitations and an ineffective cardiac function, but we also want to make sure that we um, can identify AF because with these patients, they have an increased risk of a stroke. Um, some, some symptoms patients may experience are palpitations and chest pain and dyspne dyspnea, and then signs, which are different to symptoms, is an irregular, irregular pulse, and that is your classic AF buzzword. Um, <clears throat> so with our AF, as I said, we want to assess them for stroke risk using our CHADVASC and then we're going to consider anticoagulation if indicated based on the CHADVASC score, score. And then our choice of anticoagulation would be a DOAC, so that's our apixaban or a roxaban, a doxaban or warfarin. Aspirin is not enough for stroke prevention and I've got a bit more info on that in a bit. And then we would usually rate control as first line to treat the AIF. So that would be our beta blockers, usually are the first choice. 
and then in the future if we're not getting on top of the AF you can treat with an ablation therapy and then these are some of the terms that might be used when talking about AF so you can have persistent AF if it's ongoing and not terminating or paroxymal which is episodes of AF, AF which spontaneously terminate on their own we're not sure why How is this one to do that today? It's just repeated. So it's just the principles. We've got assessing the stroke risk and then doing that um, based on their score. Potentially we'll put them on a dark or warfarin and then we want to also rate control them. And then there's other options if we can't get on top of the AF by rate control. So that this again is more repeated. So if this is confusing people, we can keep going. Plus it's also half already half past. Um, basically, you can rate control them if we don't know what time this AF started and it could have been going on and on and on. And that is the safest way to get on top of the patient's AF. Rhythm control can only be done if we know the onset um, was in within the last 48 hours. We can use cardio version as either drugs, so that would be a pharmacological one, or a synchronized DC electrical shock, which would be our electrical cardio version. And NICE would always go for the rate control, except again when we know that first 48 hours. So that's just a summary of what we've already gone through. So your rate control would be a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker. Ablation would be used for those with AF who have not responded to um, rate control treatment or they don't want to take medication. And then rhythm control would only be when um, we know that it's been a symptom on um, the AF has only started within the last 48 hours or in special circumstances if we anticoagulate them for a long enough period of time that it then would be safe to rhythm control them we can also do that but that's quite rare and then our options for that would be amiodarone or flecainide or the electrical DC cardio version. Um, not that I'm aware of Rowan I think it would be probably clinicians. Um, in the hospital, I haven't seen anyone being um, controlled because we're never quite sure when the AF started. So the safest thing to do is go with weight, with the rate control option. So a lot of the time they get started on beta blockers and digoxin to try and bring that heart rate down. Is that, is that okay? And then stroke prevention. So as I said, everyone has to have their risk of um, a stroke being stratified. That's what we can do with CHADVASC. And then you also use HASBLED on top of that to um, look at their bleeding risk whilst they were on anticoagulation. And then you make a decision whether to anticoagulate them or not. If they're low risk, so they've scored a zero as a male or a one, as a female, they do not require um, anticoagulation for stroke prevention. Any score higher than that would be deemed appropriate to anticoagulate them. So our options are warfarin, apixaban, dabigatran, adoxaban, rivaroxaban. This is a straight copy from the BNF summary with certain bits removed, but basically is um, what they advise and then also just to note anticoagulation treatment shouldn't be withheld because you're worrying about the risk of someone falling it should be based on the clinical features and patient preferences and then as I said before aspirin is less effective so you shouldn't be prescribing patients aspirin it should be warfarin or one of the DOACs and then these are our scoring system so you've got CHADVASC and has bled and then 
if you can if you click on the, these screenshots are from MD Calc, and then if you scroll down, they give you the statistics. So if someone had a CHADVASC score of two, their risk of a stroke or TIA or some sort of embolism would be 2.9%. <clears throat> if we then has bled them and their score came out as a three, we would say they are high risk of bleeding. So alternatives to anticoagulation should be considered. Does that make sense for everyone? I'm sure you've already come across these scoring systems. So flutter. So atrial flutter is also another tachyarrhythmia. Um, it's caused by um, a re-entrant rhythm within the atria as the name says, atrial flutter, so it gives it away. And that gives you your classic sawtooth appearance of P waves. And they're also known as flutter waves next to the narrow QRS complexes. Most patients in atrial flutter will be asymptomatic. They won't know they're in flutter until you do that ECG. Um, but they could have some cardiac symptoms such as palpitations, dizziness, syncope. Um, you may find when you take their pulse, they're tachycardic but you would expect their pulse to be regular. And you might find that they have some sort of um, symptoms underlying, all signs of underlying disease, such as a murmur, when you listen to their chest. So to diagnose flutter, um, that's based on um, ECG findings. Your characteristic ECG findings are a rate of 75 to 150 beats a minute and you've got regular narrow QRS complexes and the classic sawtooth appearance or flutter waves. I think we've got, I think I've got another, there's an ECG. So these are our flutter waves here and our QRS complex, more flutter. So our treatment is basically the same as AF. So you want to control the rate and maintain some sort of rhythm, but it does respond less well to drug treatment compared to atrial fibrillation. Um, you want to again beta block them, you could potentially give them a calcium channel blocker and in the acute setting you could give it IV to try and get on top of the flutter. You can also add digoxin to the beta blocker um, and then you want to get the cardiologists involved. And then um, since a lot of these patients don't respond to drug treatment, they may be offered some sort of ablation therapy to control that rhythm. And then that's just some extra notes. I'm not going to go through that. You can read them when you do, um, when you get these slides at a later date. I can send them out this evening once you've done the feedback. And again, these patients have to be assessed for their risk of stroke and potentially will need some sort of anticoagulation, the same as AF. And then these patients are at risk of developing AF once they've got flutter. And then I thought this was a really helpful summary, which you can then take away, copy, sort of zoom in. But it was very clear. Just a lot of info to try and get on one slide. And then this is just a side by side comparison of AF versus atrial flutter. So the AF is chaotic irregular rhythm and irregularly irregular with no P waves. This is your sawtooth ECG. Okay, next we're going on to heart block. So that's when you've got um, an impaired electrical conduction between the atria and the ventricles. And there's four types of heart block. So you've got your first degree, your second degree, which has two subcategories, type one and type two, and then your third degree, also known as complete heart block. First degree heart block is often asymptomatic. It's relatively common and won't require treatment. And it's when you've got a PR interval of more than 0.2 seconds. So when you're counting your ECG, looking at your ECG, the, um, from the start of the P, so the QRS is 0.2 seconds or more than 
Um, second degree heart block, as I said, there's two types. There's Mobitz type one and then Mobitz type two. Type one is where you get progressively longer PR intervals until a dropped beat occurs. Whereas type two, the PR interval is constant, but you have P waves that aren't always followed by QRSs. And then with our third degree heart block, there is no association between the P waves and the QRS complexes. So I thought the best way to show these was to go through some ECGs. And then if you all want to pop on the chat, what you think's going on. Um, symptom wise, first degree is often asymptomatic and is usually an, an incidental finding. Second degree is usually also asymptomatic, but you could have some sort of symptoms of cardiac reduced cardiac output, dizziness, syncope. They might have a slow heart rate, may even have an irregular pulse. And then it's not until you get to complete heart block where you get the symptoms more commonly present. So a, a regular slow heart rate, some sort of heart failure symptoms, fainting. You can even have cannon waves in the neck of, based on your GVP. So does anyone want to have a go at trying to identify what type of heart block is on this ECG? Okay, well, let's go. So I've done a bit of highlighting. So I've highlighted our P waves are in the red circles and our QRSs are in the purple and there is no relation between the P's and the QRSs. So this is third degree or complete heart block, as everyone see. Anyone want to have a go with this one? Okay, so this one, you've got a prolonged PR interval. So you've got a first degree heart block and then this person is also bradycardic. And then with this one, yeah, Mobitz type 2. So you've got non conducting P waves here. With the arrows. And then how about this one? We've gone through all the others, so before we decide which one this is, this kind of gives it away anyway. But does anyone know where you would measure um, how you would measure the PR interval? Start of the PTR. Yeah. And did anyone notice this wave in the yellow? That's a non-conductive P wave. So our treatment for heart blocks uh, depends on the type of heart block the patient has. So first degree, um, they don't require any treatment. It can be just a physiological thing or incidental finding. Um, with second degree type one, if they're asymptomatic with it, they don't require any treatment. Um, if they are symptomatic, they would usually be given atropine and then potentially some sort of pacing, but that's in a rare instance. Usually they are asymptomatic. In type Mobitz type two, they're more likely to be hemodynamically unstable or have like a really slow heart rate. And there's also the risk that they're gonna develop a third degree heart block. Um, so we want to make sure they have a permanent pacemaker so that's summarised here in this box. And then with our third degree or complete heart block, they are at a very 
high risk of um, a sudden cardiac death. They, if we identified that on an ECG, they would require an urgent admission, we'd get them on the monitoring, and they would have a pacemaker inserted. And I'm just going to go through ectopic beats for completeness. That was one of the other topics we wanted to cover um, in this session. Um, so the heart has lots and lots of pacemaker cells. Uh, the majority of pacemaker cells are in the sinus node, <clears throat> but all cardiomyocytes have the capacity um, to be pacemaker cells. The only reason why the sinus node cells are the rulers or the ones that are the pacemakers is because they have the fastest um, heart rate going off. Um, when we're looking at ectopics on ECGs, their, activi their activity can help us determine where they're coming from. So if it's a, a faster rate, we would expect that to be coming from the atria than if it's coming from the ventricle. So we could then say if it's an atrial or a ventricular ectopic. And then you can also look at the width of the QRS complexes and then determine if it's an atrial or a ventricular ectopic. And an ectopic basically means an extra beat. So I thought the easiest way to show this would be with this diagram here. So this is basically an ectopic. And then this is another summary table. So if the ectopic was um, coming from the SA node or anywhere within the atria, it would be seen as a narrow QRS, such as the one below here, or if it's coming from the ventricle, so the myocardial cells or somewhere within the Purkinje cells, it would be wide like this. So we can say that this would be a ventricular ectopic. So ectopics are normal and they can usually just be an incidental finding on an ECG. Um, if some people have some symptoms of it, most of the time it could be a palpitation or the sense that their heart's skipping a beat. Um, we only worry about ectopics if they've got some other underlying heart disease going on. So they've got ischemic heart disease, they've got known Wolf Parkinson White, or they've got uh, atrial enlargement, sort of dilating myopathy, something like that. Um, or known AF flutter and that's when you'd want to potentially um, act on them. I've put another link on here. This is Life in the Fast Lane. They've got some really good examples of ECGs and they break it down into atrial ectopics and ventricular ectopics. Does anyone want to guess where this ectopic has come from? Looking at the width of the QRS. Yeah, ventricular brill. Fab. So just a little quiz, just to make sure no one's overly confused. Or does anyone have any questions first? Take as a no, let me know if you do. Or you can unmute and ask a question as well, if you don't mind. Um, anyone want to have a go with this one? So Mr Bell is 74 year old male. For the last three days, he's been feeling generally unwell, experiencing diarrhea and vomiting. He's been brought into a &E by ambulance and an ECG is performed in recess. Um, it's, it's the ECG text states the patient is tachycardic with an irregular, irregular rhythm on his ECG and P waves are indiscernible. Yep, so Venetia's already got it, yeah, AF. And then what would the treatment be? Bisoprolol. Perfect. Yeah. So this was a past med question I've taken about one of the topics we've covered today. I'll give you a minute to read and then anyone wants to pop in the chat what they think the right answer is. 
Yeah, it's propanolol. So this is one of the like rules you need to learn that you can't prescribe verapamil and a beta blocker. There's a risk of forming a heart block and that could lead to a fatal arrest. So it's your non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. So your verapamil, verapamil and diltiazem plus a beta blocker can lead to severe bradycardia and even asystole where your heart stops. So you should never be given together. It's a, a rule to learn. And then these are the references I've used, mainly uh, AMBOSS, that's really good. PassMed's great for question bank and then the information that they provide like explanations afterwards. Oh, no, I don't think so. I think the question was just written to um, to test if you knew the rule of verapamil and propanolol. I don't think it was. Um, she probably would have been prescribed GTN in the first instance. Is that OK? Um, yeah, and then I've just popped some images in on these slides afterwards. I'll flick through them now. Um, these are some useful ones I just found. So it compares all um, ECGs, things we've gone through, plus a few others that we didn't have time to cover today for atrial, ventricular and heart blocks side by side. So I hope that was useful. Does anyone have any questions? These slides will probably be more useful as well when you go back through them and you start doing practice questions and stuff on PassMed. But I hope it was of some use. Thanks so much, Liv. Um, so everyone, if you'd like Liv's um, slides and you'll just need to fill out the um, survey monkey that I just popped in the chat, okay. This video will also go up on our YouTube channel in the next one to two weeks, just so you can have a look back over it if you wanted to revise. Um, but yeah, feel free to give Liv a message. I'm sure she wouldn't mind if you do end up having any questions. But other than that, thanks Liv. And I think that's everything. No problem. Yeah, any questions?